There are 52 weeks every year, and each week is important, and not a single week should ever be wasted. Have you ever stopped to consider how many weeks there have been in the history of the world? And yet there is one week that changed our world forever. It's Holy Week. It is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, beginning on Palm Sunday and ending on Easter morning. Uh, this is Maundy Thursday, and on Maundy Thursday, so much has already happened that should not be ignored. On Sunday, Jesus did ride in on that noble animal into Jerusalem, accepted and excited by the crowd. On Monday, Jesus went to the temple, turned the tables over of the money changers, and reminded them that the temple was not a place of profit, but of prayer. On Tuesday, unpopular at the temple, Jesus goes back. And what he does is he's confronted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he teaches some wonderful teachings those temple teachings that we must never forget. And on that same day, he cursed the fig tree. On Wednesday, some people call it Spy Wednesday, the plan to eliminate Jesus is it's fortified. Uh, Judas Iscariot agrees to, to deny Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And then there's Thursday. On Thursday, Jesus washes the disciples' feet and he gives them a model of servanthood in the church that is still around. But also on Thursday, Jesus gave the disciples a new memorial. And it's that memorial that we want to look at today. Uh, let me call this message, Why Are Memorials Important? Will you please pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, as we come here at this moment, we're thankful for this opportunity of being together. Uh, we're thankful for this sacred day. And while we may have had many Maundy Thursdays on, on this, remembering this particular day, may this be a special one, and may this be one that shakes us at our very core of belief. Once again, I'm thankful for your patience with each one of us, and we're thankful that you have included us into your great family. Once again, we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading, our gospel reading for today, is from the 26th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 17th verse.
Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you for the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man who betrayed the Son of Man. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, who betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you in the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Pope John Paul II once said that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian's life. I don't know what branch of the tree you're on, of the Christian tree you're on, but those words are accurate. We find ourselves today in the 26th chapter of Matthew, and those must have been anxious day for the disciples. Uh, the energy that was surrounding Jesus was tremendous, and they knew that, that something was going to happen, but they really didn't understand what it would be. It's coming to a climax. It's time for that Passover meal. And the scriptures say clearly, Jesus did not take that sacred evening and spend it with his family. He took that sacred evening to spend it with the disciples. It was a ritual that they knew well. They had done it every year their entire lives. But this Passover meal, this Seder, would have a different ending. And you can break down the scripture really with two distinct thoughts. One was that during that meal, the disciples learned something. And two, the disciples on that particular evening actually experienced something completely new. Uh, let's look at both of those things. Uh, first of all, the sacred verses tell us the disciples learned that there was a traitor in their very midst. Uh, the, the truth is that the disciples really did not expect this to happen, that they are surprised. And the truth is that any of the twelve had the opportunity to betray Jesus along the way. Jesus identifies the traitor, and the traitor is Judas Iscariot. And he must have been one of the most trusted of the disciples, because he was the one that handled the treasury. How severely has, has, has world history judged Judas Iscariot? He is considered one of the great traitors in the history of the world. And you know what happens. He regrets what he did. He hangs himself for his betrayal. And it is not a pretty picture. At the Passover, the disciples learned something new, yet they also experienced something new. Uh, what the disciples experienced was, was something that they never did really expect. As they sat at the meal, they expected the ritual to be as it had been since they were children. The Passover meal, the Seder, was a teaching tool. 
Everything that they ate, everything that they drank represented something from their proud past as God's chosen people. And with all rituals, there was a comfort in the ritual that they were comfortable with it and they could relax in it. But just when they're comfortable with it, suddenly Jesus changes the scripture and the liturgy and suddenly they're experiencing something new. Out of the blue, Jesus picks up a piece of bread and he breaks it and he shares it with them and he says that this is my body. And then he picks up the glass of wine and he drinks it and they all drink it and he says that this was his blood. All these years later, the church has recognized the significance of that moment and we classify the body and the blood, communion, the Eucharist, as a sacrament, a very means of grace. Sad to say, the thing that Jesus gave us that was supposed to unite the church has divided the church far too many times. And yet what Jesus is really doing here, if you distill the whole scripture down to a, a simple word, is that Jesus gave us a memorial. Jesus said it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Don't dismiss memorials. Memorials are important. And so here's the question for today. Why are memorials important? The first reason is obvious, that, that memorials remind us of the past. In downtown Lexington, Kentucky, uh, there is a memorial, a, a statue of a soldier, a Brigadier General John Hunt Morgan. Uh, John Hunt Morgan was not from Lexington. He was not actually from Kentucky. He was from Tennessee, and he became famous during the, the, during the American Civil War because he took this, this, this 1,000 group of men, Confederates, and he marched north. And he raided along the way as he went, and everywhere that he went, every town that he went to, he reminded the northerners that, that the war was not just a, a southern regional experience, it was a northern experience. And, and Morgan's raiders became famous. They went north out of, out of Tennessee and they, they found themselves in Kentucky. In time, they crossed the Ohio River or in Indiana when they made a hard right, went east, and found themselves in Ohio. And they weren't stopped in Ohio until July the 26th, 1863, in West Point, Ohio. West Point, Ohio was not very far from, from where we are today. And what I did one day was I drove to West Point to, to, to see what it was like. West Point's a small town. The spot was not easy to find. Actually, civilians from Lisbon, Ohio, actually went down and stopped Morgan's Raiders on that particular day. When I went to that memorial of Morgan's Raiders and where he was stopped, I looked out and I began to realize the world hasn't changed that much. West Point, Ohio today is it's rural and undeveloped. And it must have been rural and undeveloped in 1863. And in that fact, that community has really not changed a lot in 157 years. But think about it, how much has our world changed in 157 years. As we face this great coronavirus, I think we can all say that, that medicine has changed a lot in 157 years. Our mode of transportation has changed a lot in 157 years. The way that we communicate has changed a lot in 157 years. And it's safe to say that America has changed a lot in 157 years. Here's a harder question. How much has our world changed in the last 2,000 years? Every, every several years at my church, we, we do a, a Living Last Supper. And at the Living Last Supper, we, we try to reenact the famous portrait. And through the years, we've gotten different men to wear the robes and the wigs and the beards and, and all those things. And, and I can see some men every Sunday, and I'll ask them to recite their lines, and, and they can do it still. And it's a wonderful thing to do because it forces us to remember the past. It's a fun thing to do, but it's an important thing to do as a church because we're going back to the past, to that night 
that was so important, communion, the Eucharist, the sacrament, reminds us to remember that night with Jesus and the disciples. Memorials are important because they make us remember. But it isn't just that. Memorials are important because they make us remember what is important. Uh, one of my prized possessions uh, is actually this photograph. And you can't see the photograph even if it was up close and the image was clear. Because that photograph itself is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And the first copy, the original wasn't really so great. And if I look at the picture, i got to admit that all I can see are the images of all the people in there. My Aunt Phyllis, okay? My Aunt Phyllis tells me that that photograph is a picture of a family reunion, the Adams family reunion, in about the year 1900. And she said it was out on the family farm near Pierpont, really in the middle of nowhere. But all the Adamses must have gotten together that day. And if you have a picture like that of your family, it's not really unique. The oldest men sat in chairs in the front row. Okay? All the men had beards. All the women have these big heavy dresses. And all the boys, youngest children, are, are, are sitting on the ground. The only one that I have ever met in this picture was my grandfather, Roger Adams. And if you try to make out the picture, he is actually the youngest boy in front of the oldest man. And this picture is valuable to me for one reason, and that is that these were Adamses, and I'm an Adams, and that means I like to believe that the blood that flowed through their veins still flows through my veins. My children asked me once if any, anybody in our family ever did anything significant or important. I hated to tell her, no. Not a single person in my family was extremely handsome or rich, not a single Adams has ever invented anything to, to change the world. Not a single Adams that I know of has ever written a book that, that made anybody think. This collection of Adamses was really nothing more than a collection of hardworking farmers from northeastern Ohio. But that doesn't mean that being an Adams isn't important. It means certain things. It reminds us of our core values. Being an Adams means that, that you're a good person. It means that, that, that you treat people kindly and you respect anyone that you meet. Being an Adams means that you're honest. You wouldn't cheat anybody. And being an Adams means that you're loyal. You're loyal to your spouse. You're loyal to your children. You're, you're loyal to your country. And being an Adams most of all means that that you're a Christian. Adamses have always been strong church people, and I pray that we always will. What is important to you? Memorials remind us of what is really important. Communion, a memorial, forces us to remember Jesus. And it's important to realize that we partake of this body and the blood of Christ because it becomes part of us I don't know how much nutritional value is there, very small, but it becomes part of us and who we are. Communion reminds us that we are supposed to be like Jesus because Jesus becomes part of us. I read recently um, that about 25 million Americans, maybe not this year, but annually, other years, uh, actually visit the National Mall and in Washington, D.C. I love going to Washington, D.C. I always tell everybody, you got to go to Washington, D.C. I think it's just great. My wife, as the director of Protestant Campus Ministry at Youngstown State, would take a lot of international students to Washington, D.C. over spring break, and they'd heard about Washington, but they got to experience it. And I would always go as a chaperone, as silly as that sounds. And what happens is that, that, that we'd always go through all the memorials right down the National Mall. We'd start off early in the day and we go to, to, to Arlington National Cemetery 
And there's a lot of memorials in there. I always was moved by the tomb of the unknown soldier. And we saw it. And then we'd cross the bridge over the river and we'd come up behind the, the Lincoln Memorial. And the Lincoln Memorial was just great and I would love to sit there on warm spring days and, and just sit out and look at the rest of them all with, with Lincoln behind me. We'd always walk down, you'd make a right, and you'd go to the Korean War Memorial. And if you've ever been there, you know that as you walk by those statues, there's an empty feeling, an eerie feeling, a, a hollow feeling, just like that war. And then we'd cut over to the Vietnam War Memorial, and it was dark and ominous and, and very sad. Uh, one year we went to the, to, to the FDR, the Roosevelt Memorial, and I enjoyed that, and, and I remembered the parts of history that he played in. He's there with his dog. And one year we walked way over, and we went to the Jefferson Memorial. And he's kind of set apart from anybody else, but, but he's worth it. I've never done it, but I want to do it. I want to go to the top of the Washington Memorial someday. And I have to tell you, I was impressed by the World War II Memorial. The National Mall is filled with memorials, and they're all outstanding. But they're all second to one other memorial, the body and the blood of Jesus, communion. It reminds us of the past, that night with Jesus, but it also reminds us of what's really, really important. Pope John Paul II wasn't wrong. He said that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian's life. May God bless us as we take this spiritual pilgrimage together. Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, as we come here at this moment, we're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful for the times in which we live. And we're thankful for the way that Jesus has actually transcended times in many ways. And when we partake of the elements, we don't just do it with our own little group. But we do it as a world. And we do it as a history of believers. So once again, remind us ever so gently of the past, but more so, remind us clearly of what is really important. And I just pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.